Hello, hello. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, RLR VMR. It's our first of the new year, and we're very, very thrilled to have a guest join us from very, very far away where I live, at least. Um, Prof Rez will be here momentarily as he switches from his um, uh, morning report to here. And in the meantime, um, I would like to introduce our case presenter, Farah, who is calling in from very, very far away, at least for me. <laughs> Um, Farah, would you mind introducing yourself to the VMR community? Yeah, I'm Farah. I'm from Malaysia. I'm a physician, currently uh, ID fellow. So this is my first uh, presentation in CP Solvers. So here in Malaysia is uh, 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but that's okay because tomorrow is our weekend. Wow, that's incredible. Um, Farah, Prof Rez just joined. And uh, Prof Rez, uh -huh. we're graced by uh, Farah's presence. This is her first time presenting a case. Um, it's, it's 1 a.m. in Malaysia where she is now. And yet looking at her, you can't tell at all. <laughs> Farah, are you a night person? Do you stay awake late normally? Or is this unusual for you? Uh, this is, I think, the first time. So it's seldom for me to be a late person. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But I think... Uh, uh, because this is my first presentation, so I think I will take this opportunity. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present in oh, Sleepy It's our pleasure, absolutely our pleasure. Before we talk and uh, connect about medicine for the next hour, I'd love to um, ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself outside of medicine. What do you enjoy doing? Um, basically, um, my hobby is mainly uh i used to go for baking classes or cooking classes and then uh gyms and sometimes go for hiking or marathon oh nice i love how you just casually said or marathon at the end unless i misheard you um that makes me believe that you are quite the uh quite the runner if that's a casual end to your sentence um <laughs> sometimes yeah i hope you will consider running the san francisco marathon one day i hear it's a i i probably won't <laughs> but i hear it's a really really cool one um and what kind of physician are you, you said you've already you're practicing medicine now is that right yeah yeah uh, i'm practicing medicine so for about 15 years so i'm doing uh id fellowship mm. and yeah second year so you're in your uh, second year of ID fellowship in the context of practicing for 15 years. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. Farah, next time, maybe I should present a case to you. I'm not sure why you're presenting <laughs> a case to Prof Rez and I. But I'd love to pass the mic to Prof Rez to say hello, and then uh, we can get going whenever he's ready. Thank you so much, Farah, for joining us. Very excited to be here. And I we are ready. Let's Let's get going with the case. Okay, sure. So, uh, I, uh, I'll start with the shy as well as review of the symptoms. Is it okay? So, this is uh, my patient, 65 years old, female, presented with persistent watery diarrhea for two weeks. So, her initial presentation started two months ago with a productive white sputum cough associated with night sweat, loss of appetite, weight loss about 20, 20 pounds in two months. And the symptom getting worse about two weeks prior to ED when she presented with watery diarrhea three to four times a day, which was treated with one course of antibiotics without any improvements. So review of symptoms, systems, no hemoptysis, no shun of breath, no angina symptoms, even faded symptoms, and she didn't notice any swelling. Well, th thank you so much. Uh, intriguing start to this case. And, um, you know, when I see this, it's very usually when we have the chief concern, that's where we invest our cognitive energy but you have to be a little cautious here because in general, loose stools or diarrhea 
and inflammation of the GI tract can be secondary to a systemic process. Headache can be secondary to a systemic process. There are some symptoms that usually aren't just the bystander, but rather a signal to the underlying pathology. For example, if someone has a cough, that's likely to indicate something happening within the respiratory tract. So when I see this, um, and if we first start with the chief concern, despite me saying be cautious, when you're dealing with diarrhea, there's just a few important points that you need to consider. One is the duration of the diarrhea. So early, when you have acute diarrhea days, maybe a week, infection is prioritized <laughs> over the other buckets that may lead to diarrhea, specifically viral gastroenteritis or even bacterial. And most often, patients actually don't come to the hospital with diarrhea. So many of you have experienced diarrhea. You don't run to the emergency department and it resolves. Uh, we're just a bit biased because we work in the hospital. So we see people that are dealing with debilitating symptoms. But it's important to know the base rate. So when people call you and ask for your guidance, you don't just say, oh, you got to go to the hospital because I'm worried about a gastrointestinal lymphoma, or I'm worried about TB of the intestinal tract. As the diarrhea progresses in terms of duration, that's when non-infectious etiologies are prioritized. The other really important parameter when you're taking a diarrhea history, especially when you start getting more than four weeks, you're in that chronic uh, nature of diarrhea, is whether it wakes the patient up at night. That's such an important point because if it wakes the patient up at night, you can remove, for example, osmotic causes of diarrhea off the table. And all of a sudden you might think, could this be something secretory? But when you look at the rest of the data here, there are other clues that can help you sort of advance your assessment of the diarrhea for which I'm going to pass to the capital R. I'm the little R, Farai. The capital R is going to put everything together nicely for us and put us on track. Prof Rez, uh, you're a great diagnostician, but a poor speller. I think uh, your R is is the, is the capital one, my friend. And I, I agree with you. I think that the core tension in this case is to understand where this disease lives. And um, immediately when you hear that a um, process is involving multiple systems here in the chest with the cough and in the abdomen with the diarrhea, the initial instinct is to think this is a systemic disease. Um, and that instinct has to be tempered by the fact that pain isn't the only thing that the body can refer. We all are very accustomed to the idea that if somebody comes in with chest pain and arm pain at the same time, does not mean that they have a disease in both their chest and their arm. We immediately think of the possibility of an MI or aortic dissection and recognize that the arm symptoms represent a referred process with no intrinsic disease where the patient is pointing. And I think the same uh, exercise is done here. Is the cough referred? Is the diarrhea referred? Or are they truly part of the disease that actually lives in the respective organs? And with time and experience, you realize, well, actually in a patient with chest pain and arm radiation, the disease probably lives in the chest and is radiating to the arm as opposed to the very reasonable consideration that the disease lives in the arm and is radiating to the chest. And so you learn with pattern recognition about where to invest your energy. And here, the reason that you need to invest a tremendous amount of energy in this patient is because that they are literally wasting in front of you. So I'm um, here, the crux of this case revolves around the finding of an alarm sign that the patient is losing weight. And mm -hmm. so um, the evaluation will probably center around weight loss um, and use the cough and the diarrhea as clues. But I will be very happy with a diagnosis that explains fundamentally the weight loss and softly or doesn't explain a little bit of a cough and a little bit of diarrhea. 
And I think that's the crux of this case. And that's how I would work it up. And I would love to pass the mic back to Prof Rez because I think he teaches us weight loss in the best possible way with a lot of hand gestures. I can't wait to see. <laughs> but, but I will pass out one piece of advice. Everyone with weight loss needs to have a customized evaluation according to their circumstances with one exception. And that exception is everyone needs an HIV test. Everybody. So we need to tailor the evaluation to the clues we have here. But no matter what you hear, you need to get an HIV test, especially when you hear hmm, something in the lungs and something in the GI tract. But Prof. Rez, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to uh, uh, share your wisdom with the crowd about how you think about weight loss. I think it's a really good way that you teach us. Absolutely. And Rob, I just want to say your point is such a valid one. And just a few months ago, we had an 80-year-old man who was having weight loss and night sweats. And um, there was a delay in sending that HIV, but ended up having HIV complicated by diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So it's very important, that HIV uh, test. And the funny thing about it, on one of our RLR episodes, Robbie's like, if you could know one thing about this patient, what would it be? And what he was getting at was HIV, but I didn't say that. In any case, with weight loss, it's pretty, I think, straightforward in terms of the following. You have to ask the question, is there inflammation or not? So as far as presenting, we're going to be looking for clues of inflammation. And I would argue, even though we don't have the temperature yet, we don't have the white count yet, the ESR, CRP, the fact that there's cough and there's sweats and there's diarrhea, it's really prioritizing inflammation in my mind, though you can definitely have non-inflammatory causes of diarrhea that lead to significant weight loss. And once you do inflammation, and that's what Robbie did here, he took weight loss, he said inflammation, he said, is the lung and the GI tract giving us clue to where the inflammation may be originating from, where the disease may exist. On the other side of the um, bucket beyond inflammation is just look at Robbie drink his, his uh, cup of water or coffee. Yesterday I went to the dentist because we're, we're taking care of our health, right, Robbie? And the dentist said, my teeth are stained. And she's like, how many cups of coffee do you drink? And I said, oh, just four a day. And she's like, man, you gotta, you gotta cut it back. <laughs> but anyway, she polished the teeth, but I have coffee here, so I'm gonna stain it again. But in order for Robbie to grab that um, mug and drink from it, you have to have motor skills. You have to have access to the water. You have to be able to put it to your mouth and suck on that straw or chew that food. So at each one of these steps, you can have a lesion. You have to be able to swallow. Once the food is swallowed, you have to be able to absorb it. You have to be able to empty it from the stomach, be able to absorb it from the GI tract. So you can have weight loss if you have a lesion at any of those steps. And then there's one other category that you have to always consider. And this is an important one. It's what if someone ha doesn't have inflammation, has access to food, can chew it, can absorb it, what can lead to weight loss despite a regular appetite and normal eating? I'm going to leave that for the chat, but I would love to hear more from you, Farah. Um, past medical history, uh, she has long-standing diabetes and hypertension for 20 years. And two years ago, she had ischemic heart disease and uh, coronary artery bypass graft was done. And her medication list, aspirin, 100 milligram OD. She's on basoprolol, 2.5 milligram OD. Phenofibrate, 145 milligram once daily. Atovastatin, 40 milligrams on night. And pentoprazole, 40 milligram once daily. She's on tap metformin, 1 gram BD. And also insulin, sub-Q atrophy, 18 unit DDS. And sub-Q insulated, 16 unit on night. For the family history, not relevant, no family history of malignancy. Uh, social history, she's uh, from Malaysia, married with three children, retired dentist, non-smoker, non-alcoholic, and she never had any contact with PTB patients, and she did not have any high-risk behavior or recent traveling. Uh, not not to have any allergies to any drugs, to foods and drugs as well. Yeah. 
Uh, this is super helpful. Um, thank you so much, uh, Farah. I think that um, the context that this patient has is very, very interesting. And I think it's one in which we're being set up for a vascular disease process. She's certainly at risk for many. Um, and the fact that she already has had a significant ischemia. But I think you'd struggle to... Um, connect uh, a vascular hypothesis to inflammatory weight loss. And this should make you think for a moment about how ischemic disease can contribute to weight loss. And the biggest and no misdiagnosis is chronic mesenteric ischemia. It's not a good fit for this case for many reasons because the illness script doesn't quite match it in terms of pain predominance. But I think it highlights the importance of considering this disease in anybody who has vascular risk factors, especially recognizing that it's probably one of the only few chronic diseases that can become deadly in a second, meaning that a patient with chronic mesenteric ischemia remains at an elevated risk of an acute on chronic event, um, similar to other uh, chronic diseases like adrenal insufficiency. So I think that thought would cross my mind based on the past medical history. In terms of the medications, I think that there are very few medications that we find implicated as the causal in a patient with shortness of breath, though I think I was listening for the possibility that this patient has clopidogrel or P2Y12 inhibitor, given there's some really interesting ways that patients who take that medication can feel short of breath. So the absence of that is very, very helpful. Um, in terms of medications implicated with diarrhea, the list is endless. It includes PPIs, paradoxically, causing a malabsorptive syndrome, and includes metformin. Though um, the link between these medications and chronic diarrhea is weaker than the link between these medications and acute diarrhea. One notorious class of medications implicated in chronic diarrhea are the uh, ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blocker, with olmisartan being the most famous, but the other ones also being described. So I was listening for that, especially hearing that she has diabetes and hypertension, but we see that that's not present. So I don't see a robust connection between either the medical history or the medications, but can see how um, that might be the case where things be a little bit different. So she had a little bit more pain than you might think of mesenteric ischemia. If she were on an ARB, um, you might think of that uh, relevance. Um, but the, the truth is that none of those things explain the whole picture because they only focus on the GI tract and nothing with the meds. Um, I think that um, the fact that this patient is a dentist is reminding Prof Rez again to maybe sip his, his coffee uh, more slowly, but I don't think that um, it has any robust connection with uh, the current syndrome, though I wouldn't be surprised. I think it goes to show you that the most valuable history in a patient with chronic weight loss or subacute weight loss is any markers of inflammation or any uh, disease risk factors for inflammation, an underlying immunodeficiency, um, uh, <clears throat> immunosuppressive medications, and exposure history. So the fact that this patient person is from Malaysia, not too surprising uh, given your residence, uh, Farah, but I think when, it, when we get there, we'll have to prioritize the possibility of infections related to that exposure that may explain the weight loss. So definitely keeping track of that. Um, but that's what I got for this, Alakot. I'm curious what other thoughts you had, Prof. Rev. The only thing I thought about, Ravi, was when Dr. Sanders had presented that case of diarrhea that was almost sartan related. It was it was awesome that you had that knowledge base, but nothing to add. Uh, Arthur, right, tell us more. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, for on physical examination, open arrival. So the vital sign she had uh normal blood pressure, hundred and twenty over eighty millimeter mercury, not tachycardic with a pass rate of eighty bit uh, uh per minute and not tachypneic as well with a respiratory rate eighteen breath per minute, but she was febrile, uh with temperature of thirty eight degrees uh Celsius and SpO two it is good under room air, and. Finger state at that time was 16 millimole per liter. Clinically, she was alert, mild dehydrated with quartered tongue. And for the specific examination, cardiovascular examination, first and second heart sound was normal, no cardiac murmur, no inferior, and uh, respiratory sy uh, system, uh, uh, it is vascular breath sounds. Abdomen soft, non tender, no hepatospinomegaly, and no ascites. No stigmata of chronic liver disease. There's no limb synophyty and no pedal edema. And for initial blood test, 
for the full blood count, hemoglobin 8.2, it is a nomochromic normocytic with the MCV 82, MCH 25, with normal white blood cell 9.3 and neutrophils predominant and 74% with the platelet count 566. And renal profile at that time was acute kidney injury with a urea 23 millimole per liter and serum creatinine 152 micromole per liter with the potassium 6.0 millimole per liter. Liver function test at that time uh, normal studies with normal total bilirubin and no transaminitis, no other electrolyte imbalance, venous blood gas, no metabolic and lactic acidosis. For the urine ketone was negative with a protein 1 plus and initial CRP was 20 mg per deciliter. Barbara, this case is getting interesting, my friend. But uh, can I just ask you, for the creatinine, what is the normal level in your lab? So based on our value, the normal creatinine level, it is uh, for the serum creatinine, less than 120. Less than 120. So this is normal serum creatinine? Uh, this is at normal 152. Fifth, okay, 152. Got it. Yeah. And the potassium is 6, is that correct? Yeah, uh, 6.6. Milliliters per liter. And yeah. Then, can you remind us, far what was the bicarb in the sodium? Uh, bicarb was normal, 23, and sodium was 135. 155. 135. Oh, 135. I understand. Yes. understand. Um, and the CRP, is the normal less than? CRP was raised, um, more than 5. Uh, oh. Her value was 20. 20, okay. So more than 5 is elevated. Robbie, yeah. any other labs that you want to clarify before we tackle this aliquot? Not a uh, yeah, all good. Now that I've clarified all the labs, I'm gonna leave that for Robbie to discuss. I'm gonna focus on the physical exam. And you know, Farah, one of the most important steps in evaluating symptoms is whether inflammation is present or not. And this temperature of 38 fever. Yeah. One of the most specific markers of inflammation, though it's not the most sensitive, meaning there's many patients who don't have a fever and have underlying inflammation. But now we got the, now when we're evaluating the weight loss, the cough, the diarrhea, it's going to be through the lens of inflammation. And recently, Eric Strong has put together a series of videos on the physical exam. And I think one of the most important pearls through those videos is that the exam is specific, meaning if you find hepatospinal megaly, that's very predictive of hepatospinal megaly. But the absence of any finding doesn't rule out pathology in the respective organ. Meaning if you don't auscultate crackles, it doesn't mean that when we get a CT scan, there isn't you know, alveolar uh, filling process happening. Or when we get a CT lab and there isn't hepatospinal megaly. So you have to be very cautious with interpreting this physical examining the negatives don't necessarily rule out enlargement of organs or pathology within organs. So once we have inflammation, the question becomes, are we dealing with infection, cancer, autoimmunity, um, and less commonly drugs, clots, and endocrinopathies. But really, if we're being honest, the main three buckets that we consider with inflammation is infection, autoimmune, and cancer. In this patient, initially when someone is inflamed, infection is prioritized. Once that duration of symptoms persists, this is where you don't rule out infection, but you start thinking about uncommon organisms. I didn't say atypical because, Robbie, I feel it's confusing when we say atypical. Are we talking about atypical bacterial pneumonia? Or no, I'm saying uncommon organisms, meaning things like mycobacteria. And when you think of mycobacteria, immediately you got to think of its cousin, histoplasmosis. And when you think of histoplasmosis, immediately you got to think of its second cousin. I'm joking here, but you, you get the gist mycobacterial infections, fungal infections, viral. Like, could this be CMV causing pneumonitis and diarrhea? 
It certainly can be. So we got inflammation, then we use the symptoms to help guide us in what kind of infections might be at play. So if we say infection and we say uncommon, what infections have a tropism for the lung and the GI tract? And something that comes to mind is something like Legionella, but Legionella, this is too protracted for the run of the mill Legionella. And that often has a hyponatremia and it has AST, ALT abnormalities, maybe a CK elevation. So I think that if we are dealing with an infection, we're dealing with an uncommon organism, something like mycobacterial or fungal or viral, specifically the herpes viruses like CMV, also considering HIV. But you also have to think about cancer. Cancer, like one of the most common extranodal sites of lymphoma is the GI tract. So could you have a lymphoma that's involving the GI tract and the respiratory tract? Can you have a solid malignancy? It's very uh, conceivable. So I think what you need to do now is let Robbie discuss the lab, but I think imaging will be really helpful because if we see findings within the parenchyma, um, if we see findings within the abdominal cavity, it might help point us to the direction of what kind of infection or what kind of cancer. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Prof. I think you need to take a look on the inside and understand is the is this a um, radiographically positive disease or a wasting syndrome with no radiographic imprint? And I think that um, the clues that you get on the labs just reinforce the idea that the fever is real. And I think they adjust your inflammatory possibilities to some degree with, with some humility. So I think you might say that thrombocytosis is incredibly unusual in lymphoma, so I'll, I'll lower that and make that less likely. The same is true for thrombocytosis in patients with HIV. While it should not stop you from getting your um, HIV test, it's incredibly unusual for patients with HIV to mount a, a high platelet count. So you might, if you're trying to get ahead of the game, you might get those tests, but anticipate them to be even lower than they were before in terms of their probability. Um, I think um, the anemia is interesting because the, there's the possibility that the anemia may help you understand if the GI disease is intrinsic or referred. And if you then uh, show showcase that this anemia is iron deficiency anemia, that confirms the presence of intrinsic gastrointestinal disease. The reflex to think of anemia in a patient who is chronically inflamed is to think of anemia of chronic disease. And while that's a very likely explanation, I think that if you assume that you miss out on the opportunity to clarify iron deficiency, to clarify hemolytic anemia, and to clarify um, additional progress you can make on it to help you understand this disease process. So I think those tests can really, really help you um, make further progress. But I agree. I think imaging is the major next step. Um, and... Um, That'll really allow us to figure out if it's a systemic disease, and if so, where is its primary origin? All right, Farah, back to you. Okay, so the blood culture on emission turned out to be positive, non-typhoidal salmonella, which is uh, sensitive to augmentin and amoxicillin. Other than blood tests, imaging, chest is three, reveal no consolidation or cavitation at the upper lobe, no pleural effusion, and EKG, no acute ST changes. Thus, she was treated as salmonella bacteremia and initially treated uh, empirically with IV rosephine, 2 gram OD. Subsequently, we de escalate to IV uh, amoxicillin, 2 gram 4 hourly. However, after one week of antibiotic, she's still febrile. The temperature persistently more than 38 degrees, but clinically, no deteriorations. Uh, BP is still not supported, uh, saturation under room air, and then the repeated blood culture showed no growth. And we requested for the atrasal abdomen reveal uh, microabscesses of the liver with uh, less than 3 cm. So then at that time, we decided to complete antibiotic for two to, uh, for four to six weeks, and then can have it to oralize later after two weeks of antibiotics. Well, very, very intriguing twist. I think, uh, uh, Farah, what you're sharing with us is how um, how a non-typhoidal salmonella can sneak up on people and cause a subacute to chronic wasting syndrome. And I think if you're thinking about salmonella, we'd really divide it into three categories. Is this salmonella typhi? 
um, the most famous form of, uh, of, uh, of salmonella typhoid fever. Its cousin, to borrow from Prosper's salmonella paratyphi, which is technically a non-typhoidal salmonella, but actually behaves identical to typhoid fever. So you might as well classify salmonella typhi and paratyphi as semi-identical diseases. Non-typhoidal salmonella is a very different beast. The reason it's very different is because unlike typhoidal salmonella, non-typhoidal sal uh, salmonella is a disease of immunocompromised folks. Anyone can get salmonella typhi bacteremia um, without any additional reason apart from exposure. However, non-typhoidal salmonella requires the presence of some form of immunosuppression. That form of immunosuppression is sufficiently accounted in this person by the presence of diabetes, but a classic presentation of advanced HIV is recurrent non-typhoidal salmonella bacteremia. So the impetus to get an HIV test in this patient is through the roof now. Um, so that, that I think is sort of asking, why did this person get it? Diabetes is, is sufficient if you find nothing else. And then um, uh, HIV is a necessary test. So um, the question naturally then becomes, um, where does non-typhoidal salmonella go? And I think you're seeing that in your imaging modality. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about that, but ultimately mm -hmm. pass the mic to Prof. Rez to analyze how he's thinking about the fact that this person is persistently febrile, but you need to know the pattern of non-typhoidal salmonella. Just like salmonella, it is an abscess-forming organism that can form abscesses anywhere, though it has a propensity to form visceral abscesses in the liver and in the kidney. Um, but importantly, and really, really importantly, it has a strong propensity to form abscesses in the most dreaded place of all. And that most dreaded place of all is the vasculature. Aortitis, aortitis, aortitis. Persistent non-typhoidal salmonella fever mandates assessment for that possibility because it is life-threatening. It is the most common cause of infectious aortitis in the world is non-typhoidal salmonella. So I would be really, really worried about that possibility, but that's just one morbid thing. I think, I think um, there's a schema here. The schema is how do patients, how do we evaluate patients who are not getting better despite antibiotics? And for that and much more, I'll pass the mic uh, to Prof. Rez. Robbie, I love discussing with you because it seems your knowledge is endless in all things. Um, so that's really helpful because I didn't have all that knowledge, but with reading, when you arrive to that information, it really helps you advance this case forward. Um, I just have one question for Farah before I share some thoughts. Farah, was it a chest x-ray or a CT scan that showed no consolidations? Uh, no. There's no consolidation on the chest is free as well yes, as, true. yeah. Perfect. Because mm -mm. Zogan has taught us this um, through tweets and discussions that the chest x-ray is a poor person's test to evaluate the parenchyma. And now that we're worried about um, this patient's immune status, you may consider advanced imaging. And note that the CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis will get the lower lung field. This is a true story. We had a patient who presented to us a couple of weeks ago, Robbie, with right-sided pleuritic chest pain. No CT was done at that time. Comes in again yesterday with flank pain. They get a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. It shows a consolidation in the right lower lobe that the radiologist says, hey, I think this is a pulmonary infarct. Leads to a CTPE study, pulmonary embolism, infarct, and a mild pleural effusion. But it just tells you that these imaging modalities, you want to look at every single, you know, scope that you can have. And I think just a general approach to liver abscesses, like how do you actually get bacteria within the liver parenchyma? And I believe the right lobe is prioritized over the left lobe based on the vasculature and its size. You just have to think about what goes to the liver. The biliary tract goes to the liver. The hepatic artery goes to the liver and the portal vein goes to the liver. So the fact that we have a GI infection, you can easily conceive that the portal vein has taken this bacteria to the liver where it's made microabscesses. So even if you don't have a strong foundation on non-typhoidal salmonella like myself, once you start antibiotics and the patient isn't getting better, you just apply your antibiotic failure schema. And 
in that schema, if you think it's still an infectious process, the question is, is this an issue of source control? Or is this an issue of another diagnosis being in existence? Like Robbie mentioned, could this patient have HIV? And if they are immunocompromised, could there be another infection at play that we're not yet treating? So I think that's what I would prioritize from the infection perspective. Like, is it a source control issue? These abscesses are so small that you wouldn't go in and drain it. You would still just treat with antibiotics. But we don't know if the infection has gone anywhere else or if there's another kind of infection. Or is there another diagnosis at play? Remember, patients with HIV aren't only at risk of infection, but they're also risk at risk of malignancy. So I think, far what I would do next is um, get better cross-sectional imaging if that tool is available, specifically of the chest. I would send an HIV, and um, and I'll go from there. So unfortunately, she's still febrile, uh, still not able to discharge after two weeks of antibiotic because of persistent fever, temperature more than 38 temperature 38 degrees, and her serial CRP persistently raised 20, uh, 30 to 20, and we did PCT serially, and it is low. It was low, less than 0 0.2. So, and then I agree with Prof. So we did CT thorax, abdomen, and pelvic. So because we suspect of uh, either differential diagnosis and also the source control, so it is still consistent with micro abscesses of the liver, three centimeter, but no limb centipede, no intra-abdominal collection, even uh, not able to appreciate any microtic aneurysm. So other investigation that we did, bronchoscopy. So it was normal study, and it is it was negative for the bronchial uh, alveolar lavage for the PCR for the respiratory panel thirty three and echo no vegetation, all TB workout negative for the scooter AFP, even MTB chain expert. Virus screening, including the HIV also negative. Cognitive tissue screening also negative. So in view of persistent fever, not resolving liver lesion, despite three weeks of antibiotic, so we decided to proceed with liver biopsy and it's turned out to be diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So after that, she was transferred to hemato-onco for chemotherapy and further management. Wow. Um, wow. What a, a, a surprising finding. Let me ask you, Farah, was an LBH ever sent throughout her hospitalization? Uh, after that, we did send. Because initially... Yeah, initially we planned for aspirations, but then our uh, intensivists turned out to be, they did, uh, they decided to do uh, liver biopsy instead of the liver aspirations. I see. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the this is so interesting. Robbie. I'd love to hear from you in terms of your knowledge of non-typoidal salmonella. And I one thing I was thinking about is whenever you have bacteremia, of a gram negative uh, species or anything that might be of the GI tract, you always have to ask the question, is there some kind of breach in that GI tract? And we think of this in terms of cancers. We think of this in terms of other infections. Like I saw Strongy's in the chat, which was phenomenal. And that was actually the first time I met Robbie. It was when he, a patient had gram negative bacteremia at morning reporting. He's like, oh, with the, with the, the findings of the patient's demographic, was this Strongy's? And I was like, wow, it's like, it was, it was really epic. So I'm curious to know from Robbie and from Farah if this is something that we need to be concerned for when we have non-typhoidal salmonella, that is like a lymphoma, you know, breaching the GI tract. And this tells you in medicine, nothing is absolute. Like that platelet count, we would never think that, but maybe you have two opposing features here and maybe you're not involving the bone marrow with this. It's like primarily of the GI tract and, and the liver, but I will stop speaking because I don't really have anything to add and we'd love to hear from the both of you. I know, I know Farah, you're an ID uh, uh, guru, so I'd love to hear from you. I, I just know, I don't know um, a, a lot about this space, honestly. Um, I'm surprised the patient has had, uh, the, I'm surprised that the patient has diffused large B-cell lymphoma um, as the final diagnosis, but not surprised that you uncovered an ultimately an underlying immunocompromising condition. 
And I think that's the biggest lesson to learn about non-time photo salmonella is to realize that it is actually always going to be secondary to something. And I think um, I'm glad that you didn't fall for the lazy diagnosis of secondary to diabetes because um, that equally would have been sufficient. But I think that you were very shrewd in how you went about trying to prove what that secondary underlying condition is because you demonstrate persistent inflammation with a high CRP and you're using the procalcitonin um, <laughs> low as a clue that it's not the salmonella itself. And I think therefore proving a disconnect between uh, uh, the fever and the inflammation. Um, though I would never have imagined that the underlying diagnosis of B-cell lymphoma, ultimately you were very shrewd in, in um, pointing out the disconnect between infection and inflammation and you found a, a cancer, which is a really outstanding pickup and would love to pass the mic to you to see how you were thinking about this, Farah. Yeah, uh, we were struggling uh, initial. So because our, our working techniques, uh, we, we more towards, we thinking towards uh, infective origin instead of other differential diagnosis. But then uh, it is uh, initially was supported with the blood culture positive and then subsequently because of the fever, CRP was raised and low PCT and then persistent, persistent micro abscesses after about four, three, three to four weeks of antibiotics. So we need to think about other differential diagnosis so because we have in other cases, similar presentations micro abscesses in the spleen and turned out to be lymphoma. So, and then we decided, I think we need to work out for other differential. So most likely it is a lymphoma instead of TB, uh, this part of TB. So, and then decided to deliver biopsy. So I think the salmonella, non tophida salmonella bacteria, it is just like uh, concurrent the, the initial presentation. That's, that's so well said, uh, Farah. And I think uh, another example might be that you would never be happy saying, oh, this person has PJP pneumonia, full stop, that's it, end of the diagnosis. And I think you're teaching us today that you should never say that about non-typhoto salmonella, that there always has to be oh. an underlying immunocompromising lesion. Prof. Red? Robbie, uh, Fernando Valente just made a phenomenal point. And I Sort of wish I would have asked, because I was about to ask you this question, not that I knew this was like, I was going to ask you, what do you make of this potassium? I don't, I'm not as familiar with the creatinine in microliters, but maybe Fernando, can you unmute yourself and share what you put in the chat? Hi, sure. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, usually when patients have uh, diarrhea, we tend to see uh, lower potassium. So uh, a potassium of six, it's not like sky high, but I would expect it to be quite lower in the setting of diarrhea. And I was thinking if it could be a clue to, to tumor lysis, for example, now that I know that it, it's lymphoma. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fernando. I think that was such an astute pickup. Um, and those are the types of pickups that I think we learn through VMR is just trying to explain the unusual. And that may have prompted a uric acid, maybe an LDH and other laboratory findings of uh, TLS. But thank you so much. Uh, Bara, any other comments before we pass the mic to our dear Ayesha to teach us? I just want to thank you from me and Robbie and the VMR community. It's like 2 a.m. there. Uh, we hope you sleep well. And thank you for, for being here with us today and making our day. Thank you so much, Prof. And okay. so I don't have anything. And I think what I learned about is nantafoidus salmonella. It is, yeah, I agree just now. Uh, it's mostly common in immunocompromised patients. Yeah. Thank you, Farah. All right, Aisha, we're ready for you whenever you are. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah, for this amazing case. And capital R and small r, thank you for the discussion. Um, so for today, we had a 65-year-old female with persistent watery diarrhea for two weeks. So 
when we talk about diarrhea, we usually think about if it's secondary to systemic process. And then we also think about duration, if it's acute or chronic. When we're thinking about acute, we're considering it to be days, a few days. Then we want to prioritize infection. And this could be viral. We start with the basics, viral and gastroenteritis or, or even bacterial. And then when it becomes chronic, when the duration prolongs, we think about non-infectious etiologies. So when we think about this, we want to consider the, the, the type of diarrhea it is. Does it wake up the patient at nighttime? Because if it does, we can remove osmotic causes of diarrhea and think more towards secretory causes. And then our patient also had cough along with the diarrhea. So when we have these two, we want to think about if it's referred or is it truly due to a systemic process? And as the wise capital R said, pattern recognition aids in focusing in a set differential diagnosis. So when we want to, when we look at the types of what, what happens to the cough, what is happening during the cough, during the diarrhea, that can help us in uh, figuring out a set differential. And then we also had weight loss in our patients. So any patient that usually has weight loss, we should always get an HIV test. And even though weight loss uh, means that we should give them a custom evaluation tailored to each patient, um, taking into consideration what signs and symptoms they have, we should always get an HIV test. And then when we have weight loss, we should look for any clues of inflammation that are present. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in our patient, there was cough, there was sweats, there were diarrhea, which helped us prioritize inflammation. And then one of the when we were looking at the medications, we didn't see anything that was very alarming because we know that ARBs um, can cause possible cause. It is a possible cause of diarrhea. In this patient, he she wasn't taking any, so that wasn't one of our differentials. And then when we are evaluating symptoms. Our, one of our most specific marker for inflammation tends to be um, physical exam. Does it make sense? It's not very sensitive, but it is specific. And then um, carrying along with inflammation, we have three buckets to consider for inflammation. It can be either due to an infection, due to cancer, or it can be autoimmune. If it's an infection, we want to consider uncommon organisms, so mycobacterial, fungal, viral, again, HIV comes into play again. So this makes us really want to think about getting an HIV test done for this patient. And then for cancer, we want to think about any lymphomas that are involving the GI tract. And then we come to the imaging. The imaging is very important. What does it look like? Because it can help us determine if it's a systemic or a primary origin for the diarrhea or for the abscesses. And then uh, we were also looking at the anemia because the anemia can help us determine if there is something going on specifically in the GI tract, if it's an intrinsic, co intrinsic cause causing the anemia or is it a referred cause. And then once we got the imaging, further imaging, we were considering salmonella versus non-typhoidal -typho salmonella. Salmonella, we usually, it can happen to any patient. So our patient actually had diabetes. So we were thinking maybe they're immunocompromised. Non-typhoidal salmonella is a disease of the immunocompromised. So we were leading <clears throat> towards that. And we also had abscess formation in our patients. So abscess for, abscesses can form um, <clears throat> anywhere in the body, but the liver and the kidney are the most important. And we should also consider abscesses in the vascula vasculature. And then we had a chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is not very good at evaluating parenchyma, so we should consider it advanced imaging like CT scan for the abdomen. And then when we're looking at liver abscess, we should prioritize the right liver lobe over the left due to the vasculature and the size. And then as the wise little R said, when there when the patient is not prior when the patient is not recovering after antibiotics, like our patient had uh, recurrent fevers, we should think about an antibiotic failure schema. So there's three things to consider here. Is it an issue of this of source control? Is um is it an issue of an alternative diagnosis? So again, HIV here we were really leaning towards doing an HIV test. So should, should we do, is it an issue of an alternative diagnosis or is it an alternative infection that is not being treated that we have not found? And yeah, I hope I covered everything. Thank you. Covered everything, oh my God.
Oh, we see where ours are colliding into one average <laughs> side. But I'm dead. Or the little R is dead. <laughs> Actually, that was amazing. Welcome back to the teaching points uh, landscape. I think it's been the return of the legends of the Omaima yesterday and you today. It was really, really well done. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, uh, Farah. And <laughs> thank you, Prof Rez, as always. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. And um, we have a very, very special treat with our friends from Baylor joining us for IMG VMR tomorrow at the exact same time today. So um, hope you guys uh, who have the time will be able to make it then. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you, Hitting. <laughs>